Now we are in the third part for today, the interior point method. And the interior point method is the, the main way or one of the, the important ways to solve inequality constraint problems. What you see here is the definition of an indicator function. And an indicator function is defined as such. I have a, a set x and for all points that I feed into my indicator function that are included in my set big X, I return zero. And for all the points that are outside of big X, I return infinity. Okay, and uh, together with this indicator function, I can transform a constraint optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem, but with other properties that we have to get rid as well. So if I have here my function f of x, my convex function I want to optimize f of x, and it goes from big X to R, then I can transform that and write it as an unconstrained optimization problem f tilde of x equals to f of x plus the indicator function uh, for, for the big X. And actually the two are equivalent in the sense that if there exists a solution, if there exists a solution that is minimizing f of x, then this will also be the solution that is minimizing f tilde. Um, so if my solution for um, my unconstrained, so he, on, on this side I have an unconstrained f of x, and uh, for all the solutions that are outside of my set big x, I will get infinity here from the indicator function, so the, the indicator function will explode, quote unquote, and uh, therefore I am excluding all of the results that are outside of my big X, given that there are some feasible solutions um, uh, within big X. Okay, so this is a, a rather trivial and straightforward way to transform a constraint optimization into an unconstrained optimization, but it is also not very useful because um, the optimization algorithms that we are using, they cannot deal nicely with the indicator function. So the problem here is that um, if x is um, uh, um, let's put it differently, uh, the problem is that the, the function that I'm optimizing it might no longer be differentiable. So even if we had a nice function, so like, uh, like some, some square, um, that was uh, differentiable at every point, if I'm now suddenly imposing some constraints, so for example, again, I have my square, but I am um, now excluding all the points larger than a certain value, then suddenly I um, uh, I'm here jumping to a, a to infinity and uh, so then my, my function suddenly looks like this and here it, it goes against the wall and explodes quote unquote and at this point exactly uh, my function is no longer differentiable and uh, this is problematic if I end up, up at exactly that location with um, uh, with a Newton method or gradient descent then I can no longer compute a gradient. And um, this is problematic because it could be that my solution wants to exactly get very close to, 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 uh, to this border. Again, let's take the same example. Here I have a nice square, but now we're excluding more points. So now all the points larger than, for example, minus one are excluded. And then my, my optimization algorithm has, has pressure to go against this barrier and to go against this uh, uh, area, this place where um, my indicator function uh, goes to infinity. So again, here my indicator go function goes to infinity at that place and it's, it's highly likely that I end up in this place or it, I must end up in this place um, for, for this type of problem. And um, uh, earlier with the Newton method we have assumed that at the optimum, the gradient will be zero. So the main idea behind the, the Newton method was that 
I no longer do the gradient steps, but I try to find the place where I know that the, the gradient will be zero. But uh, in the constraint case, we no longer have a guarantee that the optimizer will be at a place where the gradient is equal to zero. Yeah? And, and hence, uh, overall, adding the indicator function is nice. Um, and it transforms the problem into transforms it into an unconstrained optimization problem, but that doesn't help us really because our optimization algorithms are not suited to to dealing with this kind of change. And how can we get around that? The idea to get around that is to approximate this barrier or to approximate the indicator function. And we do that by introducing a logarithmic barrier. And now I have to explain a little bit more what, what this means. Imagine a simple case, we have a convex function f of x that we want to minimize and we have some constraint uh, g of x uh, smaller or equal than zero. And um, uh, well, in this course implicitly we always assume that uh, the, the, the set of possible solutions will, will be convex. Okay, and now I take again my function f of x but instead of adding directly the indicator function, I am adding a logarithmic barrier, and the logarithmic barrier is this guy here. So minus one over t, I will explain what t is in a minute. Minus one over t, the logarithm, which in our case is also is the logarithm naturalis. We will not write ln but log. And so the logarithm of minus g of x. And what is the shape of this indicator function? So if we um, look at the way the, the logarithm is defined and at the graph of a couple of logarithms, um, then this barrier function here, um, it will approach the place where I am moving from some negative value to a positive value. And at the place where I get closer and closer to zero, my logarithm will go to infinity. And, but the logarithm is undefined over here. So if, if we are if we are then uh, if we then want to plug in a, a positive value, which becomes negative because I'm inverting, um, then um, then uh, the logarithm is no longer defined. So this only works when I'm on the negative side. But then I can approach the barrier, get closer and closer to the barrier, and the barrier will actually go up to infinity. Uh, as I get closer to, to zero. And um, now what does the t do? So, so this t here, this is a way to tune how, um, how uh, well the approximation of the barrier function should, shall be. So if I turn up this t and I, if I choose t very large, so a million or a billion or something very large, then my barrier function will look very very similar to uh, to the barrier and it allows me then to get really close to the uh, to the to the beginning of the constraint okay so now we have an approximation of the barrier function and this approximation of the barrier function is actually uh, um, differentiable uh, given that I'm inside uh, so the approximation it does not even evaluate when I'm outside of the feasible set. But as long as we are inside the barrier, as long as we are in the interior of the solution set, uh, as long we can find a derivative and maybe also a second derivative, depending on the f, um, and uh, then use our uh, proven methods with the gradient descent or the, the Newton method. Okay. So what we have to compute for the, the Newton method is uh, uh, the, the gradient and the Hessian. And so these, these formulas might look intimidating, but uh, they're actually quite simple. So, so this is just the way how uh, the derivative of the log barrier is formed. Uh, but we will usually not do that by hand because we quickly go to interesting optimization problems that have many dimensions that I can no longer solve by hand. So this is just a formula that we have to plug into the computer um, and uh, to get the gradient and the Hessian. 
and then we can have our function extended by the logarithmic barrier to cover the inequality constraints and solve it with the Newton method, for example. Okay, but we need to have an admissible point with which we start. So we need to have a point in the interior of the solution set that must be inside. So it, the, the, the initial point with which we start cannot lie exactly at the boundary of the constraint because again, at that point, I, I wouldn't get a gradient. Okay, and uh, now once more, we have the nice property that the minimizer, so the, the solution that is minimizing overall, will also have a zero gradient in the extended function with the, with the log barrier. And uh, now this is not exactly an unconstrained optimization problem because outside of the logarithmic barriers, um, the function is undefined. However, as long as I stay inside the feasible solution set, it looks like an unconstrained optimization and I can also uh, apply the gradient descent and the Newton method. I only have to be a little bit careful, for example, uh, with line search. And uh, so if, if by line search I end up at a place outside of the barrier, I have to cover that uh, and uh, well, well handle that special case. Otherwise, the, the gradient descent method, for example, it, it uh, works really nice. But how should we set the t? Uh, so now, if we, are, if we have this logarithmic barrier and uh, we can tune the t to say how precise we want the barrier to be, uh, how should we actually set that t? And if we set the t uh, too small, then we might have a solution that is far away from the optimum because um, the barrier is too extended or is not, is, is, is a, is a, is not a pre precise enough approximation. And if I set my t too big, then I might run into some numerical issues uh, because then in the gradient that I get back, I, I cannot, I don't see where the barrier will begin and I will need many, many steps. Um, um, yeah, because um, my, my algorithm has no indication how the the barrier will, uh, will change his course that he should take. Um, but um, we get around this trade-off by not choosing a fixed t, uh, but by increasing the t over time. So the, the term for this is sequential unconstrained optimization, and this goes back um, more than 50 years now. And um, what uh, they do here is we have now several inequality constraints and uh, in the image here the inequality constraints uh, are indicated as um, hyperplanes or, or half spaces and all the points that are behind such a plane are then excluded and then we have the intersection of all the points that are on the right side of my inequality constraints, all the points in the intersection um, are then still contained. And uh, in addition, here you see an, um, these, uh, these ISO lines that indicate where our barrier lies. And uh, then we start with some initial interior point and then we do the optimization. And um, uh, as we then increase our T over time, our barrier will get tighter and tighter. And in, for every t that we choose, we do an optimization. And then the first step, we might end up here. Then we increase the barrier a little bit, um, redo the computation, then we end up here. Then we increase the barrier a little bit, uh, do the computation and end up here. And therefore, by sequentially solving optimization problems where the barrier is tightened more and more, um, we, uh, we no longer have the, the problem of running into numerical issues where the barrier is too tight initially. But uh, when we are already at a place that is really close to the barrier, then if we tighten that a lot, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt us as much. Okay, so now it's again an iterative method. And uh, so we have, um, um, we, are, we are solving this optimization problem here. And uh, the idea is that we take the result xk and use the result xk as the starting point 
um, for the optimization in the next iteration k plus 1. Okay, so now we have basically a two-step approach with an inner iteration and an outer iteration. So the inner iterations are, for example, the gradient descent steps or the Newton method steps for solving this optimization problem where the t is a fixed number. And then we have a result for that, or we are close enough. Um, then we do an outer step and increase the t. So we then go from k to k plus 1, and we are increasing our, our t, and we are tightening the border, uh, the barrier. And then we recompute this inner optimization problem uh, starting at uh, the last solution. Okay, but still, how should we select the t? And there are a couple of uh, rules for that, uh, but just, just the, the basic idea is when I increase my t too fast, then I might have a big distance between the, the last point that was the solution of the optimization problem and the next point that I'm looking at. So uh, in a sense, it is preferable to have a couple of intermediate steps uh, because then I can, for example, profit from the superconvergence of the Newton method. So because if I'm actually rather close to the solution, my Newton method will converge uh, superlinearly and uh, I can profit from this superconvergence if, if my solutions are not too much apart by going from, from 1 tk to the tk plus 1. However, if I increase my t too slow, then I will need many, many, many of these intermediary steps and then overall I will also lose. So the idea is to balance this out and to find an increase of the uh, of this uh, of the barrier tightening um, that um, well leads me to the solution the fastest and there's a nice th theory for that so there's a book by Nesterov and Nemirovsky uh, that got published in 1994 and that triggered a small revolution in uh, optimization uh, and they define the theory of so-called self-concordant functions. Uh, and uh, they can, by that, increase the TK maximally fast so that they always stay inside this bassin of superconvergence for, for the Newton method. Uh, however, the material from Nesterov and Nemirovsky is, is too advanced for this course, and it's, it's even far too advanced for this course. So we know that this theory exists, and we can also apply it in some special cases where we know some properties of the function f we are minimizing, but we will not go into the details and into the proofs. So this is, from a mathematical level, quite quite advanced, and uh, you would do that if you were doing a PhD in, in, in mathematics concerning optimization. Okay, now this was quite a lot of theory. Now let's look at the optimization problem that we wanted to solve initially and let's make it a bit more concrete with some real examples. Uh, we want to solve the optimal resource allocation problem. Now consider that you want to spend the 5 million euro on advertisement. Uh, so you run a company, you have some kind of product, you want to sell a lot of these products and the idea is to spend the 5 million euro in a way that um, the most number of people possible have seen your advertisement at least once. So an actual advertisement agency, they want, to people, they want people to see the advertisement multiple times because uh, when you see advertisement multiple times, you will better remember the product, you will remember the song of the advertisement, things like that. And um, they want to get into the general consciousness of, of society, so to speak. But in this case, for sake of the optimization problem, we just want as many people as possible to have seen the advertisement or your product at least once. And now further, assume that we have two possible channels for advertisement available. The first channel is TV advertisement. And uh, well, you have 40 million people watching TV in the assumption. And... Um, uh, there's a certain cost, so you have to pay 200,000 euro to be shown at, a, at the time before a nice movie, something like that. 
And then you also consider that you have a 2% chance that your advertisement is seen per TV watcher and ad run. So um, if you, on the first day, if you run your ad, uh, you have 2% of 40 million people in expectation uh, seeing your advertisement. But if you then repeat the advertisement, then you assume that the 2% have already seen the advertisement. So there now only are 98% um, of 40 million people times 2% remaining that can see the ad for the first time on, on the second day or whenever you show the ad a second time. And therefore we have the, uh, we have the decrease or the diminishing return. And uh, now we have here this, this red function that uh, shows that by, uh, if you uh, run the ad um, xi times, um, how, how many people will have seen the ad. Okay, and the other advertisement possibility that we have, it's the newspaper advertisement, and now we say it costs 100,000 euro for every run. Uh, you have the possibility, or you have uh, 20 million readers, and again, but then you have an increased chance per newspaper reader to have seen the ad. So the convergence here is a little bit faster. And it also here it converges to uh, 20 million people that at most can, can see your ad. And because on the second day, only 80% of the 20 million remain that might see your ad for the first time. Okay. And now the, the number of people who saw your ad um, uh, can be expressed with these two formulas. So for TV, it's 1 minus 98 to the power of x TV uh, times 40. So this is just uh, the, the formula expressing here the, this curve that you see converging here. So um, uh, oh, there's a slight confusion here. So x TV and x paper is the number of times you run the ad. And then the result, r TV and r paper, this is the number of people who have seen your ad. Um, so the actual models for advertisement by, by advertisement specialists, they are a lot more detailed than that. They, are, they do optimization, they do that also quite a lot, uh, but um, uh, they have much more detailed model. And now if you go then to Facebook and hyper-targeted advertisement, then they go much more into detail of, of target groups and how people might influence each other and stuff like that. So there's a lot of optimization also going on in the ad space, uh, but here we have a, a simplified model that might we have been realistic uh, a couple of years ago, but today it's the, the, the industry is much more advanced. Okay. But now we only have 5 million euro available, so we have limited money. And um, we can at most buy 25 TV advertisement campaigns. So here, if we look at the feasible results, uh, so then we can buy between 0 and 25, I should do that in red. <laughs> between zero and 25 TV advertisement campaigns can be run. And because the newspaper advertisement costs less, I can buy up to 50 runs of the news newspaper advertisement, but I can also um, run a combination of them. So uh, any point that is inside of this shaded area would be a, a feasible solution. Um, uh, so then I would even spend a little bit less money than I have available. But, and uh, if you look at, the, at this uh, line over here, these are exactly the combinations of ad runs where I am spending the full 5 million. And uh, what we expect is that our optimization problem will try to push us out here so that the optimization problem will try to to make us spend as much money as possible to reach the most number of people. Uh, but we have this uh, condition here that uh, the maximum number of investment is, is bounded. And um, uh, well, we now have to see where we actually end up, how much money we should add on uh, uh, or put into the different advertisement uh, channels. Okay, we do that. First of all, we write down our optimization problem. So here we are maximizing a concave function. Uh, so and these is, are just the two uh, 
advertisement channels, how much people they can reach. Uh, now the notation is a bit shorter. We say X1 for TV and X2 for, um, for, for the newspaper. And uh, now we are adding the inequality constraints. So in total, we must not spend more than 5 million euro and we can only spend a positive number of money on, on each advertisement channel. And now we convert this problem by adding the logarithmic barrier. So now we are removing the, the inequality constraints and we are pushing them into a logarithmic barrier each. So now here we have a logarithmic barrier that we want to spend less than 5 um, million euro. So if I'm here increasing x1 and x2 too much, then this value inside the brackets will get negative and then the logarithm is no longer defined. But if I get closer and closer to zero for the expression here in the brackets, then I'm, um, then I'm only approaching the, the logarithmic barrier. Um, okay, and obviously I then have also the two constraints for positivity. So x1 and x2 need to be positive. And uh, I have to find out one initial point uh, with which I want to start. So I select some random point, let's say 1 and 1 or uh, 10 and 10 on, uh, for x1 and x2 as the initial point, And then I can employ gradient descent or the Newton method. And now what is happening? I get an optimization problem that depends on this t the factor that is tightening the logarithmic barrier. And now let's see what happens when I'm increasing t. So we, we start with some very small t, let's say 0 0.1. And uh, what you see on this side here, on the right hand side, these are the contour lines of the optimization problem. So this is like looking at the optimization function, at the target function from, from the top, and then seeing the ISO lines like on a map when you go to the mountains and you have a map showing you the height lines of, of the mountain. And now the, the, the optimum, it will be, it will be somewhere, somewhere here in, in the middle. And so our barriers are very uh, approximative and um, we, are, we are pushing our optimal solution uh, to, to the middle. And now we tighten the barrier and we see that when, when we tighten the barrier, we will move slowly to the edge and then when we tighten the barrier more and more, uh, we get really close to the edge. And now T is at most 100 here, so we can still see something visually. But of course, numerically, this is not yet very advanced. So we can also push T out to like uh, 10,000 or a million or a billion or something like that. This has some limits, um, but uh, we can really tighten the barrier quite, quite a bit. Okay. And now we are converging and the solution to which we are converging is here to have 18.7 uh, uh, TV advertisement runs and to have 12.4 uh, newspaper advertisement runs. So it might be possible that uh, you can only uh, do complete runs and not uh, that you don't allow real numbers here, but this is again uh, a relaxation, so to speak. Uh, if we were only uh, if we were constrained to complete uh, advertisement runs, so to natural numbers, then this would be a so-called mixed integer problem. But again, that is not part of what we consider the convex optimization problems for this lecture. Therefore, we, we just allow here the, the results to be, to be real numbers. Okay, so we have found our optimal solution. It lies here visually. And uh, with this, we reach about 31.38 million people that have seen our advertisement for our product at least once. Okay, for this example, we had just decided on some initial feasible points. And uh, because we were only in two dimensions, we could select an additional, uh, an initial admissible point by, by just looking at the problem and uh, this will not be possible when we go to higher dimensions. So when we go to really high dimensions, it might be complicated even to find a point that is inside our admissible set. And uh, we have to use a, a dedicated method 
to, to find our first initial point. So we, we want initial point that is strongly admissible and strongly admissible here means that it is holding all the inequality constraints, meaning that the point is on the interior of the admissible set. And how we do that? We are solving a smaller optimization problem. So um, we have a, a number of different constraints. So we have the constraint gi of x smaller or equal to zero, and we have the constraint g2 of x smaller or equal to zero, and so on. And what we now do is we introduce what is called a slack variable. So we, we don't know initially um, where the feasible points are. So uh, we, we define an unconstrained optimization problem with what we are calling a, a slack variable, because now we have, we introduced the slack variables, we are calling it S, and uh, now we have G1 of X minus S should be smaller than zero. And then also G of X minus S smaller than zero and so on. And when we have a solution where the slack variable is um, uh, where the slack variable is smaller than zero, oh, then we have exactly found an admissible point. Okay, but initially we set the slack variable larger than the maximum of all the, the inequality constraints so that we are sure to have found an initial point that is feasible. Um, oh, I said initially that we construct an unconstrained optimization problem. We construct an easier um, constrained optimization problem where we exactly know where the initial point has to be. So we, we select any x0, any starting point for the original problem. And then an s, our slack variable, such that it is bigger then the constraint that is if, that is violating um, the the most. Okay, and then we have our slack variable so that um, well these uh, terms here are all smaller than zero. And now for this new optimization problem, what we want to do is we want to minimize s and to get s as small as possible. And as soon as we have found a solution where s is smaller than zero, and for the current x also um, all the constraints are holding, then I can stop and then I, have, then I know that I have found a combination of points x that is feasible for the original optimization problem. Okay, and now we can uh, solve this optimization problem, this uh, simplified optimization problem, uh, with the interior point method, I have a way to construct the initial point where I know that I know that it is admissible. And uh, I can then apply some other iterative method, gradient descent, Newton method, and so on, for optimization. And as soon as I found a solution where the, the s, the slack variable, is smaller than zero, then I can stop. And I have already found my solution, my corresponding uh, x, that uh, is strongly admissible. When I am converging with this method, when I am solving this optimization problem, I am converging and the s is still bigger than zero, then I know that no admissible solution exists. Then I know that my inequality constraints, so let's, let's draw this. Let's say here I have two inequality constraints and um, the feasible solution set would be here uh, in, the, in the overlap or in the intersection, uh, but it could also be the case that there is no overlap. Yeah? It could also be the case that then here at no point do the two, uh, the, the solutions for the individual inequality constraints overlap and then there is no admissible solution. Yeah? Then the interior or then, yeah, there is no admissible solution. And um, then I can al already stop because the original problem is unsolvable. Okay, but there's also a third case where I'm optimizing and in the optimum, S is exactly equal to zero. 
and this then indicates that there is a solution to the original problem, but that the solution is uh, not on the interior, but that the solution lies exactly on the boundary. And um, that happens if I have the inequality constraints that are here exactly touching. So they have their, um, for the each inequality constraint, the solution set. And there is, there, is a, there is a solution that fulfills all the constraints. Uh, it, there can also be several possible solutions. So if the, if the inequality constraints here would, would, uh, would intersect on a line, for example, then there could also be several solutions. But there is no interior for the uh, intersection. And that means I cannot use the interior point method because without the interior I cannot um, find a gradient because I'm already at a point where my logarithmic barrier has, uh, has, has gone up to infinity. Okay, so now we have a method of finding an initial point, an admissible point that is on the interior and we can then use the barrier method or the logarithmic barrier where we are tightening the barrier more and more to uh, converge to the point of the constrained optimization problem.